we have been talking about selfishness or ego-centeredness, the dangers of selfishness, the origin of selfishness, the foundations on which selfishness is established. We talked about getting rid of selfishness and the advantages and benefits or the anisong of destroying selfishness. In today's talk, we will look at the method of practice that eliminates selfishness. The main principle involved in eliminating selfishness is to realize the three characteristics of, of things, that they are impermanent, unsatisfying, and not self. In general, to, to see that all the things that we attach to as self and all the results of that attachment which we take to be mine. So all the things that we take to be I in mine, to see that they are impermanent, unable to satisfy, and selfless. This is the general principle. You should know in advance that all the realizations of various stages of spiritual attainment are merely the result of penetrating impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, and not self to the various degrees. We call each of these realizations the the penetration of path, fruit, and nibbana. There are four stages of attainment representing various levels of purity and wisdom. Each of these involves the application of path or correct practice and then the realization that selfishness is being cut and then the nibbana, the coolness of that selfishness being eliminated. This happens on the level that is called stream enterer and then it continues to the level called once returner and then the level of non-returner and finally the highest level of spiritual attainment, the arahant, the perfected, awakened human being. In each of these levels of attainment, the essential thing is that they all arise out of seeing impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, and not self to that degree. And so these attainments progress as the realization of anicca, dukkha, and anatta, impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, and not self progresses. penetrating to these three facts or three characteristics is the only way to to relieve and lessen selfishness. This is the only way to completely eliminate them. So to the degree that these facts are penetrated and realized, to that degree selfishness will lessen and dissolve. So this obviously points to the need to be very interested in these three facts of existence. And by being interested in them, 
we begin to practice in order to penetrate to their deepest and most profound level of meaning. We do this in stages, beginning on a relatively superficial level of understanding. But as practice deepens and strengthens, this understanding progresses by stages to deeper, more profound, and more complete realization of these three truths of existence. Now we'll talk about the, the methods for seeing these three characteristics. In general, we can talk about two methods or two approaches which are complementary. The first is through study, through study, through thinking and reasoning about these things. We develop a theoretical knowledge of the three characteristics. The second method is that of practice, of practicing Dhamma correctly in order to realize these three truths within the mind, directly within the mind. So there is the, the method of study and the method of practice for realizing these truths. We're talking about knowledge and we should understand that knowledge has three fundamental levels. The first level is the level of learning, of study. Learning by hearing the words of another or by reading. This is knowledge, one level of knowledge. Then by taking that learning, thinking about it, reasoning about it, applying rules of logic, and so forth, we come to another kind of knowledge, the knowledge of reasoning. This is also knowledge, a second level of knowledge. But then there is a third kind of knowledge, the knowledge that comes from direct experience of that thing, of whatever truth it is. To be clearly aware of that truth without having to think about it, without having to reason or use, depend on any logic, any assumptions, or so forth. This is the third kind of knowledge. To truly understand something, we need all three levels of knowledge. We can't stop at just the first or second level. This is something we should understand, that this word knowledge can be a bit vague and ambiguous. So be careful to make sure that knowledge is complete in all three ways. So these three characteristics of all compounded things can be seen on these three levels. There's the level of learning and the level of thinking, reasoning, and all philosophy. All philosophy philosophical, theoretical systems would fit under the second kind of knowledge. These, this learning and thinking and philosophy all makes up the, the group of theoretical understanding. Then we come to the, and we can, under, we can have some understanding of these three characteristics in a theoretical, even a philosophical, way. But then we shouldn't overlook, we should be especially interested in understanding them directly by ourselves. And this involves practice. For these, instead of using words and ideas and theories to understand reality, the thing is to deal with reality directly. For the truth or fact to appear in the mind, to be manifest in the mind, and then for the mind to see it clearly. The mind has to make direct contact with that truth within the mind in order to truly realize it. We can call this spiritual experience 
to experience the thing directly and spiritually. You can think about past experiences if you want, but that doesn't compare with directly experiencing these truths here and now, right now. This is the most direct, the most powerful way. And this gives, this we can call intuitive or intuition, insight. It's to see these truths with intuitive wisdom. Not an intellectual philosophical wisdom, but the intuitive wisdom of direct spiritual experience, which is when the mind, these things arise in the mind, they appear in the mind, and then are seen clearly, distinctly, obviously, by the mind. Now we'll talk about the objects, the, the matters that are taken up for contemplation in order to realize these three truths. These various objects that we can use can be separated into two groups once again. We can see them as two basic groups. The first group of objects are the objects that use, are used as the basis for thought, for intellection, for reasoning. These objects are used, or reasoning is used, in order to develop an understanding of the three characteristics. And so thought, and theories, and ideas, and reasoning, logic, is used. But this, these kind of objects are always dependent on reasoning. This understanding is dependent on reasoning, and so it is not really free. We could even say that this is to be a slave to logic and reasoning. This, this is the first group of objects. The second type of object or matter for contemplation are objects which the mind experiences directly. These objects have nothing to do with reasoning, with logic or any kind of thought. They're completely free of logic and reasoning. They're not dependent on reasoning in any way. The first group of objects is always connected with reasoning and so they are always dependent on or trapped within the limitations of reason and thought. The second group of objects are completely free of that. They have nothing to do with reasoning and thought. Because with these objects, the mind makes direct spiritual contact. The mind doesn't perceive these things through the medium of thought or reasoning. It makes direct contact with the things. It's a direct, immediate kind of awareness that has nothing to do with reasoning. The first kind of objects, the first group, is always associated with reasoning. The second group is above or beyond reasoning. And so it's through the second group of objects that we can go above and beyond the world as well. We've got a very easy example to, to point this point out for you. Think about sweetness, the sweetness of sugar. For a person who has never eaten sugar or never tasted anything sweet, although they hear from other people that sugar is sweet, they won't really know what that means. They might, no matter how much other people tell us that sugar is sweet, we, that person still won't know what this sweetness really is. Even though that person could watch other people 
taste and eat sugar and see the the joy they had in that sweetness still the the person who had never tasted sweetness wouldn't know what sweet means but once that person goes and tries some sugar then they will have the direct experience of what sweetness is in this way the two the two kinds of knowledge are incomparable the knowledge of just hearing from somebody else's words or from thinking about it is not the same as direct experience of of sweetness until the person actually tastes and experiences sweetness for him or herself until then there is no real understanding of what sweetness is the same is true with the characteristics of impermanence unsatisfactoriness and not self we can hear about them from others we can think about them all we want we can read books we can even write books about it but all that thinking and philosophizing is nothing compared with just a moment's direct experience of anicca dukkha anatta the kind of experience that has nothing to do with reasoning in that direct experience these characteristics become very clear in a way that words and logic can never do even the mangiest dog when it tastes tastes sugar it knows what sweetness is with human beings when we taste sugar we can go and talk about it we have the ability to speak and talk about all kinds of things but as far as the direct experience of sugar we're no better than the mangiest dog who still has to go and taste the sugar to know what it is and we are the same we have to taste it for ourselves experience it for ourselves and then whether we talk about it or not that experience is very clear now we'd like to talk about the influence that these two ways of knowledge have upon life the person who has never tasted sugar no matter what people tell them about sugar it still won't lead to any sense of what sugar is like they won't have any feeling for sugar they'll be completely indifferent because they don't know what sweetness is but once they taste sugar for themselves and know what sweetness is then they have a feel they have a sense of sweetness and this has it and then sweetness has an influence on them the just the words doesn't doesn't lead to sweetness having any influence but the direct experience of it gives sweetness some some influence it leads to certain changes in one's feelings and attitudes the same is true with the truths of anicca dukkha anatta by developing theoretical understanding of them it doesn't really lead to a re- a feel for them there's no direct understanding of them and so it really doesn't have any influence it doesn't have much of an influence on life it surely doesn't have any influence on the mind the mind continues attaching to things as always but when there is direct spiritual contact and experience of impermanence unsatisfactoriness and not self this has a very profound influence on the mind when the mind actually realizes these directly clearly distinctly then this leads to the lessening the dissolving and the disappearing of attachment and of selfishness this this difference is very very important 
just by thinking about these three truths doesn't really change anything. It may change our way of speaking. We may have a new vocabulary to talk about. It may change our thoughts, but that's all that will change. All the thinking can change is our thinking, our, our opinions. But to really change things in the mind where the problems are arising, this has to come from the direct experience of these three truths and through that spiritual contact, not through theoretical understanding, but through spiritual experience, intuitive wisdom. That is how these truths can cut through and eliminate attachment. In our Dhamma practice, our goals are very, very practical. We're practicing to bring about a fundamental change in life. And so we're talking about what is capable of bringing about this change and mere theoretical understanding does not lead to any fundamental change. It only leads to a superficial change in the thinking or maybe the words we speak. It takes the direct spiritual experience to bring about a true and profound change in the mind. This is the importance of direct experience of the three truths. We want to emphasize that when we talk about the mind, the mind we could also discuss as having various layers or levels or whatever. Mere theoretical thought and understanding only has a superficial influence upon the mind. There's no real deep and profound effect, but through the direct contact of the mind with these three truths, these three facts of existence, then there is an influence that goes all the way to the, the deepest part of the mind. It penetrates to the very core of the mind, to what we might call the spiritual sphere of the mind. Much of the mind is only concerned with worldly, material, external things. And this part of the mind can be influenced by thinking and reasoning. But to get to the real depths of the mind, to totally transform the entire mind, requires to get all the way to the spiritual sphere, the spiritual center of the mind. And this requires the change that is brought about by direct experience, by intuitive wisdom of the three facts of life. Although there is this great difference between theoretical understanding and direct experiential spiritual understanding, in spite of this, that theoretical understanding is the cause for the, the spiritual understanding. If nobody told us about sugar, if nobody explained how sweet sugar was, how delicious it was, then we would never go and taste it. And so that beginning theoretical understanding about sweetness led to our going and finding some sugar tasting it and then knowing it for ourselves. And so we, although that theoretical knowledge is not enough, it's not the real thing, we can be very thankful for it because it was the cause of our finding out what the real thing is. It's the same way with Dhamma practice. The theoretical understanding is not the real Dhamma. It's just words and theory about the Dhamma. And then, but nonetheless, it is the cause. It's what gets us started. We hear about how wonderful the Dhamma is, how delicious it is, how sweet. And then we begin to practice in order to realize the Dhamma for ourselves. 
that theoretical knowledge isn't the true knowledge of Dhamma, but it's the knowledge which we can be very thankful for, whether we read it in books, hear it in talks, or whatever. That theoretical knowledge gets us going, begins us practicing in order that we can experience the Dhamma for ourselves. So it involves active work. It involves activity. To realize the Dhamma is an activity which we must very earnestly set out upon. And in doing so, we can realize what is meant by the, what is pointed at by the theoretical understanding. So we encourage you all to to do this work, to put this these, this theory into practice in order to taste the sweetness of Dhamma. And most of all, we encourage you to practice anapanasati because in mindfulness of breathing, each step and stage of the way, there is not theoretical understanding, but there is direct experience understanding of Dhamma. So please put this theory into practice and realize the Dhamma through that practice. Mindfulness of breathing is the the only way, the the most proper way of using, (coughs) it's the most proper system of objects to directly experience the Dhamma. Now when we say this, don't think that we're trying to play propaganda for mindfulness of breathing, that we're, we're getting in arguments with other, other places or whatever. Our only purpose in saying this is to express that we've, we've gone through just about everything. We've tried all kinds of different things. We've done, we've gone through all the theory. And in what we have, in our experience, mindfulness of breathing is the most direct and the most efficient way to realize, to truly penetrate to these three facts. To penetrate to them not in a superficial way, or in a out of balance or deceptive way, but to truly get to their essence. This anapanasati is the most efficient and complete way of doing so, as far as our experience can say. We'd go so far as saying that by practicing, practicing mindfulness of breathing is like picking up a spoonful of sugar and tasting it for yourself. For this reason, we would like to talk about the, the practice of anapanasati, of mindfulness on breathing. We won't talk about all the details of the practice, but we'd like to talk about the outline or the spirit of anapanasati will give a concise overview of what is involved in mindfulness of breathing so that which will explain how it is that mindfulness of breathing is a way to get to the objects in which we directly experience the three facts We'll begin with an overview or panoramic view of anapanasati so that we can see the general structure of mindfulness of breathing as well as where it goes, how it gets there and where it's heading. In mindfulness of breathing, as you've probably heard, there are four areas or groups or stages of practice. In each of, each of these four groups are necessary. 
they must be completed in order to truly meet or truly experience the objects that will reveal the three facts of life. And not only that, in order to directly experience those three facts themselves. The first area or the first tetrad of mindfulness of breathing has as its goal the gathering together and focusing of the mind's energy. In this first tetrad, we practice in order to find the, the power or energy of samadhi, samadhi, concentration. Usually the mind is scattered and dispersed. What we do, what we need to do is to gather it together, collect it together and focus it in order that the mind has enough power to penetrate into the reality of things. The mind needs very, a very strong, powerful focus in order to see through and into the truth of whatever it is it is focused upon. So in the first tetrad, we are merely developing this concentration, this the power of concentration. In the second tetrad, we deal with the vetana, the feelings. The feelings are very dangerous, dangerous things. The various pleasant, unpleasant, and uncertain feelings are the basis which cook up all kinds of defiled thought and behavior. And so we, know, we have to learn how to, to manage these vetana so they don't cook up all kinds of defilement. Even though the mind may be very concentrated, there can still be some very happy feelings coming in and interfering. So in the second tetrad, we take those very, very happy, some of the this greatest happiness in order to, to examine it. Usually, the Vetana delude us into thinking that things are permanent, beautiful, and <clears throat> satisfying, and that they are selves. And so what we do is we take these most pleasant feelings, the happiest feelings, and, and penetrate through them into seeing that they are actually impermanent, unsatisfying, and not self. In doing so, we are able to cut through or eliminate the influence that these vetana have upon us. And so they no longer have any power to condition any defilement. And then in this way, we learn how to deal with the vetana so they no longer interfere with the mind. This is the second tetrad, dealing with the vetana, the feelings. In doing so, we of course use the genuine feelings which are taking place within the mind. It's dealing with the real thing. It has nothing to do with logic or reasoning. You're probably thinking that there are dozens or hundreds or even thousands of feelings, and, and there are, but we can categorize them all as either pleasant or unpleasant. What we do in mindfulness of breathing in this second tetrad is take the most pleasant of all those pleasant feelings. We take the most blissful feelings that everyone is searching for and attaching to, and we examine them until we see through them and cut off or cut through their influence. In the first tetrad, in developing samadhi, there arise very powerful and very pleasant feelings. And so in the second tetrad, we examine, we contemplate, we fully experience 
these various kinds of pleasant feeling, rapture, happiness, joy, bliss, whatever we want to call them. Usually these, these very subtle, these very powerful, very pleasant feelings that come out of mindfulness of breathing, concentration, are something we attach to very strongly. They're the most attractive kinds of feelings and we attach to them with great, with great strength. And then through this attachment they're tricking us into thinking that they are permanent, beautiful, satisfying, and that they are selves. And this leads us into all kinds of efforts to acquire more and more of these pleasant feelings because of this attachment to them. So in the second tetrad, we deal with these feelings directly and examine them and contemplate them until seeing that they too are impermanent, unsatisfying, and not self. And when this is realized, they lose their influence over the mind. They no longer have the power to pull us around by our noses. And so this is what takes place in the second tetrad. Usually because of our desire for these pleasant feelings, we do all kinds of things in order to acquire them. Sometimes it's we try and get these happy feelings from sex or from sensual pleasures. Other times we do it from our thinking or for non, non-material kinds of, non-physical kinds of activity, including even concentration practice. But whatever the source of these pleasant feelings, they still are the basis for attachment and they can still disturb the mind to no end and lead to all kinds of defiled, selfish behavior. So in this tetrad, we see through them and see that they are merely impermanent, unsatisfying, and not self. This is the work of the second tetrad of mindfulness of breathing. If I was to say to you that you are enslaved to the Vedana, if I said you're enslaved to the Vedana, first of all, you wouldn't believe me. And second, you would probably scold and criticize me for saying it. You would probably start complaining. But the fact of the matter is that everyone is enslaved to the Vedana, whether pleasant Vedana or unpleasant Vedana. These feelings are pulling us around all the time. Depending on the kind of feeling, it pulls us in the appropriate direction. We're constantly being dragged around because of our enslavement to to feelings. All the kinds of when when something is lovely, beautiful, attractive, then those the feelings arising out of that pull us towards sensuality in trying to get and up, up possess and keep those th- beautiful, attractive things. And when things are unattractive, then the unpleasant feelings that arise lead us to want to harm, destroy, and even kill because of those unpleasant feelings. We're slaves to these feelings. They, they cook up all kinds of reactions and behavior. And we have, generally, we have very little control over this process. So in the second tetrad of Anapanasati, we learn how to see through these feelings. If you can accept that you are caught within the dualisms of positive and negative, if you can realize this and accept this, then you will realize that you are a slave to the Vedana because it's all the same thing. Things that are positive lead to pleasant feelings and we say they're good. Things that are negative or attribute or classified as negative lead to unpleasant feelings and we say that they are bad. 
and this conditions all kinds of reactions and responses. We're slaves to these feelings. In this second group of mindfulness of breathing, we learn to get free of this, this trap. We learn to release ourselves from this enslavement to the Vedana by seeing through them. And then they no longer have the power to dominate our lives. They are no longer our masters. This is the essence of the second tetrad, is to free us from the domination and enslavement to the feelings. In the third tetrad, what we do is train the mind that, so that it is completely under control. Once the mind has been freed from enslavement to the feelings, then it must be brought, brought completely under control that, so that it has the highest ability to do the work that needs to be done, which is to, to see directly, to penetrate directly into the truths of impermanence, non-satisfactoriness, and non not self. When the mind is very highly trained like this, when it is completely ready to perform this necessary duty, then the third tetrad is completed. And then the mind is ready, it's perfectly tuned for the, the work of realizing the truths of anicca, dukkha, anatta. The fourth tetrad is seeing everything, seeing all things as they really are. This means seeing all the things that have deceived us and that are deceiving us, to see all of these deceptive things as they truly are. They have been able to deceive us because we don't see them as they really are. So now, we take the mind that has been highly trained, the mind that has been concentrated in step one or in tetrad one, and then that has transcended the power of the feelings in step two, and that has been highly, finely tuned in tetrad three. This mind now is completely freed from the influence of things. These things no longer have any influence, at least when the mind is in that high state, that highly trained state, these things don't have any influence over it. And then that highly trained mind is used to examine, to contemplate everything, to see that they are impermanent, unsatisfying, and not self. When we, see, when we say that we will see everything what we mean is all the things that come into contact with us, all the things with which we are concerned. Anything that we have no business with or that we never come into contact with, that is not of our concern. In this fourth tetrad, we take all the things that have been causing us problems. We take all the things that make up our life. These are what we, we contemplate in order to penetrate into their, their truths, to, to have direct spiritual contact, to have direct insight and experience into the impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, and not self of those things. And then they will <laughs> no longer have any power or ability to trouble or disturb us anymore. We'd like you to recall that in observe the objects we take for seeing impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, and not self, we take things that are actually truly occurring internally. It would still be of some value to take to think of external objects. That would be of some value, but the most powerful, the most valuable way of realizing these three facts is to take things that truly are already happening inside. And so in mindfulness of breathing, 
we use the various exercises that have taken place in which we can recreate at will. So we take the first exercise of experiencing the long breathing by and we see that the experience of the long breathing, the long breathing itself, is impermanent, unsatisfying, and not self. And then the second exercise of experiencing the short breathing. This is contemplated until we realize that the short breathing is impermanent, unsatisfying, and not self. And then the third exercise of contemplating the interrelationship the, between the body and the breath, of seeing what influence the breath has on the body. This interrelationship, this influence, is seen to be anicca, dukkha, anatta. And even the fourth exercise of calming the breathing, of using the breathing to calm the body, although the excitement, the agitation of the breath is calmed down, this calming is nonetheless impermanent, unsatisfying, and not self. So even just by using these four exercises as the objects of contemplation, it is still possible to, to realize these three facts in a very profound way because they are internal facts. They're things that are actually truly happening right here and now. The same basic principle is followed with the second tetrad. But now instead of using the physical things of the breathing and body, we use the objects are the feelings that have been worked with in the second tetrad. These are true, actual feelings which we have are very experienced with, which we know very well, such as in the fifth step or the first exercise of the second group, which deals with piti or rapturous satisfaction. This is something, this is a very strong, excited feeling which makes the mind tremble with with happiness. This is so stimulating, this kind of joy, that the mind shakes and quivers with this happiness. It's a very disturbing kind of happiness. And so this PT, or rapturous satisfaction, can be contemplated, and then it is because it can be made to happen whenever we need to and then we contemplate it as it actually is occurring within the mind and then see that it is impermanent, unsatisfying, and not self. And then we can let that calm, cool down and calm away, which leaves a very subtle and soothing kind of joy which we might call bliss. And this is the sixth exercise, or the second exercise of the second tetrad. And this very soothing, subtle bliss is also contemplated and seen as anicca, dukkha, anatta. Then the, the third exercise of this second group, the ability to condition the mind, the influencing of the mind by these different pleasant feelings, that, that is also anicca, dukkha, anatta. And then the calming, the the calming away of these feelings so that they no longer disturb the mind, so they no longer have any power over the mind. This fourth exercise of the second tetrad is also an object which happens inside, within the mind, that can be the basis of realizing anicca, dukkha, anatta. So using the four exercises of the second tetrad, we can develop an even more profound experience of these three facts. Even in the four exercises of the third tetrad, all of these reveal the truths of anicca, dukkha, anatta. No matter what mind state, whatever, no matter what kind of mind it is, 
whether it's a joyful, gladdened mind or a very, very firmly, steadily concentrated mind or a mind that has been liberated from all attachment, no matter what the mind state is, whatever kind of mind it is, it is nonetheless impermanent, unsatisfying, and not self. And so these four exercises of the third tetrad are the are just more objects for realizing the, these three truths. So there are these three tetrads, and each tetrad has four exercises. That's the meaning of tetrad. So there are 12 exercises to contemplate, to take as the objects. And in each of these exercises, we will discover impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, and selflessness in each and every one of them. And in this way, we come to a very full and complete understanding of these three facts. To take external objects isn't enough. There will never be a profound enough experience of these facts if we merely use external things because the mind can't have a direct enough contact with those external things. The only way is to use these internal things. And these 12 internal exercises of mindfulness of breathing in which the mind directly experiences anicca, dukkha, anatta, this is enough. It's probably even more than enough to fully awaken, to fully be to have a direct enlightenment of these three truths. The most important thing is to see impermanence completely, to keep contemplating the object, whatever the object is, until seeing its impermanence completely. Don't, don't stop before that. Don't walk away or give up. Stay with the impermanence until the impermanence is fully realized. And then in that realization of impermanence, the, we will realize the unsatisfactoriness of the thing. If it's always changing, it can never bring us satisfaction. It can never fulfill our wants and desires. And then by fully realizing that dukkha, that unsatisfactoriness, then it is seen that there's nothing in that object that is a self that can stand up that can resist that change and unsatisfactoriness. There is no self in there, and this is to see anatta, not self. And then when the object is seen to be not self, then, then we realize that it is void, that it is sunyata, void of I in mind. If there's no self there, there's nothing there that can be I or mine. And if it's void and empty of I in mind, then it is ta ta ta. It's just that. It's it's just this. It's such like that. It's you can't say anything else about it except it's just that. We stop wanting to say it's I in mind, positive or negative, and all those other deluded attributes which we're attaching to things. It is just seen to be what it is, just that, with none of these illusions attached. And then, then it is seen as it truly is, da ta da, just that. The first step of the last tetrad is contemplating impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, not-self, voidness, and da ta da just thatness or suchness. This is the thirteenth step overall or the first step of the fourth tetrad. The second step of the fourth tetrad is to contemplate, to keep the mind focused on the fading away of attachment. The result of seeing impermanence and so forth is up through da ta da is that attachment begins to break up, dissolve, and fade away. This dissolving of attachment is what is contemplated in the second step of this tetrad. 
the result of realizing, of fully realizing this fading away of attachment is that attachment ceases. Step 15 is the contemplation of the extinction, the complete, the remainderless extinction of attachment. By remainderless, this means once it's extinguished, it's completely gone, it will never come back again. Step 15 is contemplating this final extinction of attachment to things as self or as belonging to self, as I and mine. And there's one last step. Now that in step 15, all attachment has been thrown away, all attachments, all objects of attachment, all I, all mine, and all selfishness has been thrown away. There remains one last step. The final exercise is to see that all I in mine has been thrown away, that we've tossed it off and are no longer burdened by it. This is a bit funny that we have to go and realize it, but this is the final step, is to clearly see that all these attachments, all self and all selfishness has been thrown away. I've, I've gotten rid of it all, finally. This is the thing that must be clearly realized in the last step. When any feeling, thought, or emotion comes up and disturbs you, when any kind of thought or emotion disturbs your mind, this is the weapon we can point at it. We can take the weapon of contemplating impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, and anatta and point it at that thought or emotion and kill it so that it doesn't cause any more suffering. When we can learn to do this, to see all things as impermanent and so forth, then they cannot cause any more suffering to the mind. To see everything, everything internally and externally, everything mental and physical as merely impermanent. They're all changing all the time. And to see this impermanence fully means that they cannot cause any harm or do any damage. And then there is no tukka, no suffering. In ourselves, in others, in anything, even in a rock, there's nothing but ceaseless change. There's just a constant flow, a flow of change. There's nothing that stays still for even a moment. Even in these rocks, or in the trees, in the plants, in the sky, in everything, there is this constant, ceaseless flow and change. When we learn to see all things in this way, they have no ability to harm or to cause suffering. This is the most powerful weapon we can use on anything that causes any problems. It's just to see that it is impermanent unsatisfying and anatta, not self. This is the value of this, of seeing these three facts, because in seeing these facts, nothing can do any harm. This is the value of realizing, fully penetrating to these truths. And on this note, we would like to end today's talk. <coughs>